Edwardian homes in Britain's towns and cities were, in many cases, the same loathsome mass of terraced houses of the previous century, jerry-built and thrown up quickly to accommodate workers flooding into urban areas to find work in the Industrial Revolution. For the poor, this often meant renting a room or two within a house sublet from landlords who themselves were responsible for the payment of families overcrowded into small and mean rooms. And mean they were, for these poorly built houses lacked ventilation, suffered damp and had a lack of basic sanitation. What's more, even if the money in your pocket couldn't stretch to better accommodation, you could find yourself renting a room through which another family had to pass to get to theirs, or even a room in a dark and fetid basement. If that wasn't recipe enough for a nightmare existence, then you might be unfortunate enough to live in mortal danger of your life. A false step from a first-floor bedroom directly onto stairs with no banisters, saw too many men, women, and children fall to their death. In the 1900s, housing had begun to improve following successive public health acts that regulated minimum building control and sanitation standards for new homes. That doesn't mean that people weren't still living in substandard housing. Far from it. Wretched pre-regulation homes didn't disappear from the streets until the slums were cleared in the 1930s. Poorly maintained, if at all, and deteriorating to such an extent that you could rent a room for a much lower price than in new houses built to the new standards. Like the Victorians of the previous era, Edwardian working-class families continued to occupy homes of the most evil character. In 1909, Maud Pember Reeves, a social reformer, initiated a study through the Fabian Women's Group into the domestic lives of working-class families living on around a pound, or 20 shillings, a week. In this video, you will discover her investigations into the appalling state of housing for working-class families in London's district of Lambeth. You will find out just how much you would have to pay to stay in cramped, unhealthy conditions and the hardships tenants face to keep up with the rent so that they could put food on the table. Discover more about the domestic lives of Edwardians in my video, Eating with the Edwardians. Let me know in the comment section what you would think about the state of housing on offer to these families. If you are on a tight budget, with several children to clothe and feed, would you risk renting cheap on sanitary accommodation to ensure that they were well fed? Or pay for more room with better light and ventilation, perhaps substituting meat and vegetables for bread and hoping to chance that you would stay in a job to pay the landlord's rent? Before we move on, please consider clicking the subscribe button for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. You can also support the channel and get access to exclusive perks by becoming a channel member. Check out the Join button and description for more. The chief item in every poor budget is rent, and on the whole and roughly speaking it is safe to say that a family with three or more children is likely to be spending between seven and eight shillings a week on rent alone. Why do they spend so much when, as we see, it must mean cutting down such a primary necessity as food? To find the answer to this question, an analysis was made of the conditions of 31 families with three or more children who happened to come within the scope of the investigation. Decent housing has as much influence on children's health as, given a certain minimum, the quality and quantity of their food. That is to say, it is as important for a young child to have light, air, warmth, and freedom from damp, as it is for it to have sufficient and proper food. One good upstairs room may cost as much as a couple of dark and damp basement rooms, 
and, though that one room may mean horrible overcrowding for a family of five or six persons, it may nevertheless be a wiser and healthier home than the two-roomed basement, where the overcrowding would nominally be less. As a matter of fact, owing to insufficient beds and bedding, the whole family would probably sleep in one of the two basement rooms, and therefore the airspace at night would be no more adequate than in one room upstairs, while bronchitis and rheumatism would be added to the dangers of overcrowding. The kind of dwelling to be had for seven or eight shillings a week varies in several ways. If it be light, dry, and free from bugs, if it be central in position, and if it contain three rooms, it will be eagerly sought for and hard to find. Such places exist in some blocks of workmen's dwellings, and applications for them are waiting long before a vacancy occurs, provided, of course, that they are in a convenient district. There are even sets of three very small rooms at a rental of five shillings sixpence in one or two large buildings. These are few in number, snapped up, and tend to go to the man with not too large a family and in a recognised and permanent position. Perhaps the next best bargain after such rooms in blocks of workmen's dwellings is a portion of a small house. These small houses are let at rents, varying from ten shillings to fifteen shillings, according to size, condition, and uh, position. They are let to a tenant who is responsible to the landlord for the whole rent, and who sublets such rooms as she can do without in order to get money for the rent collector. She is often a woman with five or six children, who would not, on account of her large family, be an acceptable sub-tenant. If she is a good woman of business, it is sometimes possible for her to let her rooms advantageously and stand in herself at a low rental as rents go in Lambeth. But there is always a serious risk attached to the taking of a whole house, the risk of not being able to sublet, or, if there are tenants, of being unable to make them pay. Many a woman who nominally stands at a rent of six shillings or six shillings six pence for the rooms, which she keeps for her own use, is actually paying eleven shillings to fifteen shillings a week, or is running into debt at a rate of five shillings to ten shillings a week because of default on the part of her lodgers. The ordinary housing for eight shillings a week consists generally of three rooms out of a four-roomed house, where the responsible tenant pays ten shillings or eleven shillings for the whole, and sublets one small room for two to three shillings, or of three or four rooms out of a five- or six-roomed house, where the whole rent might be fourteen or fifteen shillings, and a couple of rooms may be sublet at six or seven shillings. Some of the older four-roomed houses are built on a terrible plan. The passage from the front door runs along one side of the house, straight out at the back. Two tiny rooms open off it, a front one and a back one. Between these two rooms, at right angles to the passage, ascends a steep flight of stairs. Because of the narrowness of the house, the stairs have no landing at the top, but continue as stairs until they meet the wall, where the landing should be. But it is not. Two doors leading into a front bedroom and a back stand opposite one another, and open directly onto the steps themselves. Coming out of a bedroom with a child in their arms, obscuring their own light from the door behind them, Many a man and woman in Lambeth has trodden on the edge of a step and fallen down the stairs to the ground below. There is no handrail, nothing but a smooth wall on each side. Of the four little rooms contained in such a house, perhaps not one will measure more than twelve feet the longer way, and there may be a copper, a boiler for heating water for washing, wedged into the tiny kitchen. A family of eight persons using three rooms in a house of this kind might let off the lower front room to an aunt uh, or a mother at a rent of two shillings sixpence a week, live in the kitchen and sleep in the two upstairs rooms. The advantage of such a way of living is its privacy. The single lodger, even if not a relative, 
is less disturbing than would be another family sharing another house. When the lodger is a relative, a further advantage is that a child is often taken into its grandmother's or aunt's room at night, and the terrible overcrowding is relieved just to that extent. In some districts, four rooms may be had for eight shillings a week on the further side of Kennington Park, for instance. Here, the plan of the house is more modern. The stairs face the front door, have a handrail, and any light which the passage affords. The front room may be twelve feet square, and the kitchen cut into by the stairs ten feet square. There is a tiny scullery at the back, which is of enormous value, as the ten feet square kitchen is the living room of the family, sure to be a fairly large one, or it would not take four rooms. Upstairs are three rooms. Two at the back will be very small, and the front one, extending the whole breadth of the house, perhaps fifteen feet by twelve feet. A family of ten persons, now living in a house like this, lets off one of the small back rooms at a rental of two shillings, and occupies the four remaining rooms at a cost of eight shillings a week. The copper belongs to the woman renting the house, who makes what arrangements she pleases with her lodger in regard to its use. There are four-roomed cottages in Lambeth, where there is no passage at all. The front door opens into the front room. The room behind opens out of the front room. The stairs lead out of the room behind, and twist up so as to serve two communicating rooms above. Here, the upstairs tenants are forced to pass through both the rooms of the lower tenants every time they enter or leave the house. The inconvenience and annoyance of this is intense. Both exasperated families live on the edge of bitter feud. There are two-roomed cottages reached by alleyways, where both tiny rooms are below the level of the pathetic garden at the door. One sanitary convenience serves for two cottages. Here the death rate would be high, but not so high as the death rate in the dismal basements where two families share a six-roomed house. The landlady of the two probably chooses the ground floor, with command over the yard and washing arrangements. The upstairs people contract with her for the use of the copper and yard on one day of the week. The downstairs woman hates having the upstairs woman washing in her scullery, and the upstairs woman hates washing there. Differences which result in not speaking often begin over the copper. Three rooms upstairs and three rooms downstairs would be the rule in such a house, the downstairs woman being answerable to the landlord for thirteen shillings a week, and the upstairs woman paying her six shillings. Each woman scrubs the stairs in turn, another fruitful source of difficulty. Some of these houses are frankly arranged for two families, although the landlord only recognises one tenant. In such cases, though there is but one copper, there will be a stove in an upstairs room. In some houses, the upstairs people have to manage with an open grate and a hob, and nearly all of them have to carry water upstairs and carry it down again when dirty. On the whole, the healthiest accommodation is usually to be found in well-managed large blocks of workmen's dwellings. This may be as dear as three rooms for nine shillings, or it may be as cheap as three very small rooms for five shillings sixpence. The great advantages are freedom from damp, freedom from bugs, light and air on the upper floors, water laid on, sometimes a yard where the children can play, safe from the traffic of the street. But there are disadvantages, the want of privacy, which is very great in the cheaper buildings, the tendency to take infection from other families, the noise on the stairs, the inability to keep a perambulator, are some of them. There is no such thing as keeping the landlord waiting. The rent must be paid, or the tenant must quit. The management of most buildings exacts one or two weeks' rent in advance, in order to be on the safe side. A tenant thus has one week up her sleeve, as it were, but gets notice directly she enters on that week. In some buildings, the other people, kindly souls, will lend the rent to a steady family in misfortune. 
Oh, a carter's wife. One of the cases in the investigation had her rent paid for ten weeks while her husband was out of work and bringing in odd sums far below his usual wage, by the kindness of the neighbours who saw her through. She was in good buildings, paying a low rent, and as she said, If I'd have got out of this, I'd never have got in again. <laughs> she paid off the money when her husband was in work again, at the rate of three shillings sixpence a week. The three quarters of a small house, or the half of a larger house, are likely to be less healthy than buildings, because houses are less well built, often damp, often infested with bugs which defy the cleanest woman, have as a rule no water above the ground floor, and may have fearful draughts, and no proper fireplace. Their advantages are the superior privacy, and possibly superior quiet, their accessibility from the street, and, above all, the elasticity with regard to rent. On the whole, the actual landlord is by no means the monster he is popularly represented to be. He will wait rather than change a good tenant. He will make no fuss if the back rent is paid ever so slowly. To many respectable folk, keeping the home together on perhaps twenty-two shillings a week, this is an inestimable boon. It is wonderful how, among these steady people, rent is made a first charge on income, though, naturally, given enough pressure, rent must wait while such income as there is goes to buy food. Rents of less than six shillings a week are generally danger signals, unless the amount is for a single room. Two rooms for five shillings sixpence are likely to be basement rooms, or very small ground-floor rooms, through one of which perhaps all the other people in the house have to pass. One of two such rooms visited for fifteen months measured eight feet by twelve feet, had doors in three sides of it, and was the only means of exit at the back of the house. Two sets of basement rooms at five shillings sixpence visited during the investigation were extremely dark and damp. In both cases the amount of coal burned was unusually large, as was also the amount of gas. One of these basements was reached by stairs from within the house, the other from a deep area without. The former was warmer, but more airless, while the latter was impossible to warm in any way. The airlessness of basement dwellings is much enhanced by the police regulations, which insist on shut windows at night on account of the danger of burglary. Both the women in these two homes were languid and pale, and suffered from anemia. The first had lost three children out of seven, the second one out of four. Four and six paid for two rooms, meant two tiny rooms below the level of the alleyway outside. Rooms which measured each about twelve feet square. A family of six persons lived in them. Four children were living, and five had died. The question of vermin is a very pressing one in all the small houses. No woman, however clean, can cope with it. Before their confinement, some women go to the trouble of having the room they are to lie in fumigated. In spite of such precautions, bugs have dropped onto the pillow of the sick woman before the visitor's eyes. One woman complained that they dropped into her ears at night. Another woman, when the visitor cheerily alluded to the lovely weather, answered in a voice of deepest gloom, Lovely for you, miss, but it brings out the bugs something horrible. The mothers accept the pest as part of their dreadful lives, but they do not grow reconciled to it. Repapering and fumigation are as far as any landlord goes in dealing with the difficulty, and it hardly needs saying that the effects of such treatment are temporary only. On suggesting distemper rather than a new paper in a stuffy little room, the visitor was met with the instant protest. But it wouldn't keep the bugs out a minute. It would seem as though the burning down of such properties were the only cure. The fault is not entirely that either of the sanitary authorities or of the immediate landlords, nor is the blame to be given to the people living in these houses. In spite of being absurdly costly, they are too unhealthy for human habitation. Sanitation has improved vastly in the last dozen years, though there is still a great need for more qualified, authoritative women sanitary inspectors. 
but no inspection and no subsequent tinkering can make a fundamentally unhealthy house a proper home for young children. The sanitary standard is still deplorably low. That is simply because it has to be low if some of these houses are to be considered habitable at all, and if others are to be inhabited by two, and often by three families at the same time. The landlords might use a different system with advantage to the great majority of their tenants. To insist on letting a whole house to tenants who are invariably unable to afford the rent of it is to contract out of half the landlord's risks, and to leave them on the shoulders of people far less able to bear them. A woman who can barely stagger under a rent of six, seven, or eight shillings may at any moment find herself confronted with a rent of ten shillings, sixpence, or fifteen shillings, because in her desperate desire to let it all, she is forced to accept an unsatisfactory tenant. Turned into a landlord in her own person, she is wonderfully long-suffering and patient, but at the cost of the food of her family. If ejectment has to be enforced, she, not the real landlord, has to enforce it. She goes through great stress rather than resort to it. Houses intended for the use of more than one family should, I consider, be definitely let off to more than one family. Each tenant should deal direct with the landlord. The tenants might do more for themselves if they understood and could use their rights if they expected to be more comfortable than they are. They put up with broken and defective grates, which burn twice the coal for half the heat. They accept plagues of rats or of vermin as acts of God. They deplore a stopped-up drain without making an effective complaint, because they are afraid of being told to find new quarters if they make too much fuss. If they could or would take concerted action, they could right a great many of the smaller grievances. But when all is said and done, these reforms could do very little as long as most of the present buildings exist at all, or as long as a family of eight persons can only afford two or at most three small rooms to live in. The rent is too dear, the houses are too old or too badly built, or both, the streets are too narrow, the rooms are too small, and there are far too many people to sleep in them. The question is often asked why the people live where they do. Why do they not live in a district where rents are cheaper and spend more on tram fares? The reason is that these overburdened women have no knowledge, no enterprise, no time, and no cash to enable them to visit distant suburbs along the tram routes, even if, in their opinion, the saving of money in rent would be sufficient to pay the extra outlay on tram fares. Moreover, strange as it may seem to those whose bi-weekly visit to Lambeth is like a bi-weekly plunge into Hades, the people to whom Lambeth is home want to stay in Lambeth. They do not expect to be any better off elsewhere, and meantime they are in surroundings they know, and among people who know and respect them. Probably they have relatives nearby who would not see them come to grief without making great efforts to help them. Should the man go into hospital or into the workhouse infirmary, extraordinary kindness to the wife and children will be shown by the most standoff neighbours in order to keep the little household together until he is well again. A family who have lived for years in one street are recognised up and down the length of that street as people to be helped in time of trouble. These respectable, but very poor people, live over a morass of such intolerable poverty that they unite instinctively to save those known to them from falling into it. A family which moves two miles away is completely lost to view. They never write, and there is no time and no money for visiting. Neighbours forget them. Oh, it was not mere personal liking which united them. It was a kind of mutual respect in the face of trouble. Even relatives ceased to be actively interested in their fate. A fish fryer lost his job in Lambeth owing to the business being sold, and the new owner bringing in his own fryer. The man had been getting twenty-six shillings a week, and owed nothing. His wife's brothers and parents who lived nearby combined to feed three of the four children. A certain amount of coal was sent in, 
the rent was allowed to stand over by a sympathetic landlady to whom the woman had been kind in her confinement. And, at last, after nine weeks, the man got work at Finsbury Park at twenty-four shillings a week. Nearly three pounds was owing in rent, but otherwise there was no debt. The family stayed on in the same rooms, paying three shillings a week extra as back rent, and the man walked daily from south of Kennington Park to Finsbury Park and back. He started at five in the morning, arrived at eight, and worked till noon, when he had four hours off and a meal. He was allowed to lie down and sleep till 4 p.m. Then he worked again till 10 p.m., afterwards walking home, arriving there at about one in the morning. A year of this life knocked him up, and he left his place at Finsbury Park to find one in a fish shop in Westminster, at a still slightly lower wage. The back rent is long ago paid off, and the family, now with five children, is still in the same rooms, though in reduced circumstances. When questioned as to why he had remained in Kennington instead of moving after his work, the man pointed out that the back rent would seem almost impossible to pay off at a distance. Then there was no one who knew them at Finsbury, where, should misfortune overtake them again, instead of being helped through a period of unemployment, they would have nothing before them but the house. It is obvious that, in London at any rate, the wretched housing, which is at the same time more than they can afford, has as bad an influence on the health of the poor as any other of their miserable conditions. If poverty did not mean wretched housing, it would be shorn of half its dangers. The London poor are driven to pay one-third of their income for dark, damp rooms, which are too small and too few in houses which are ill-built and overcrowded. And above the overcrowding of the house and of the room comes the overcrowding of the bed, equally the result of poverty, and equally dangerous to health. Even if the food which can be provided out of twenty-two shillings a week, after seven or eight shillings has been taken for rent, whereof first-rate quality and sufficient in quantity, the night spent in such beds, in such rooms, in such houses would devitalize the children. It would take away their appetites, and render them more liable to any infection at home or at school. Taken in conjunction with the food they get, it is no wonder that the health of London school children exercises the mind of the medical officials of the London County Council.